Welcome back to another video. Um, today I'm going to show off a special project of mine. Um, one that's now probably three or four years old. It's um, a Canadian Army for World War I Vimy Ridge scenario that I ran back at a friend's house um, for a group gaming session between about six or seven people. And um, just a bit of background that um, World War One is probably one of my favorite topics to research. It's a, a somber experience, but I really, I'm really interested in it, and I'm interested in the characters and you know the the trench warfare and the Eastern Front, Italian Front, Gallipoli. Um, basically, a World War One junkie, if, if that's a, a term even at all. But building and painting a World War One army is is sort of difficult to do in the sense that. Skirmish level doesn't seem quite right and you know battalion level doesn't seem quite right because of the nature of the the trenches the trenches went from one end of the of basically Belgium all the way down to the Switzerland border the border and the Western Front I never I never really understood you know I never got the feel that's a better term I never got the feel for the World War One gaming experience because at, at platoon level at company level at battalion level at regiment level, at brigade level, at division level. It, you know, division level might be a little differently, but all those other levels, I never got the sense of the scale, of just the intense scale of the conflict. And although I would love to paint a 28 millimeter army of World War One figures, and I think I, I think I will do eventually, I, I do have the the um, War Games Atlantic Germans to paint up their new box set, which looks really good. Um, I was always looking for a rule set of World War One, uh, for to play World War One, in the scale that my mind had visioned it in, and I settled upon these. Uh, War uh, Great War Spearhead Two Rules by Sean Taylor. So it's a it's a really nice book actually. It's uh, I love the binding books that way it sits flat on the table. Um, I, I picked up this set of rules and. I decided to go with either 10 millimeter or six millimeter armies. Initially, I settled on 10 millimeter. And um, there was some manufacturers out there that made 10 millimeter figures for World War One, but for some reason, I collected hundreds of them and I painted hundreds of them, but they didn't look right on the table. It still looked a little bit too big. So <laughs> I went with what you see in front of you here, which is six mil. Now for six millimeter figures, I really only had two options at the time, at least. There was Bacchus, who had a, a new, newly, fairly newly released set of figures, or Heroics and, no, uh, Heroics and Ross, was it? Heroics, um, yeah, Heroics and Ross, um, or I think Rapier as well, I think had, had some, but essentially I had to, um, oh no, it wasn't Heroics and Ross, or maybe it was. You know what, I can't remember, it's been years. But I do know that there was irregular miniatures, 6 mil, there was Bacchus, and I believe it was either Heroics and Ross or Rapier, probably Heroics. But I decided that I was going to have to order them in. Like Bacchus had a picture of their figures on their website and they looked really nice. Um, regular had a picture of their figures on their website and they looked serviceable. But Heroics and Ross did not have pictures, so I had to order the packs to even see what they looked like. So I took a gamble and I ordered them. And what you see laid out in front of you here is the efforts that I put into this system, into this, this excellent rule set. Now, before I show you the figures, which probably why I clicked on the video, um, I want to talk about Great War um, Spearhead 2, the rules, just for a small bit. Um, I did run this game for about, like, like I said, about seven or eight people at a, at a, a not a convention, but at a, a Private, private residence and it was kind of like a group game uh, several people were invited they made a whole day of it we had barbecue it was a really nice day and um we played um a attacker defender uh scenario with these figures and with these rule sets and the rules were really good i have to admit when i bought the rule set sorry for the camera shake but when i bought the rule set you know it seemed to be what I wanted to be, but there was a lot of. It. They're not an easy rule set to understand. They are an extremely easy rule set to play once you understand, 
but understanding the rules was a little tedious. And normally when I get a rule set, what I do is I, I read through it and I make notes and then I take those notes and I, you know, I boil them down to the base things that you need to know, like how you need to move, what you need to do to get initiative, what you need to do to shoot, to save, blah, blah, blah. And I usually make a cheat sheet. And my cheat sheets are usually about one to two pages. Um, but for Great War Spearhead, the cheat sheet was nine pages. And that was a, a new one on me. That was a, a lot. You can't really call it a cheat sheet when it's nine pages. But it took looking in the rule book and I put that on the side. I never even had to look at the rule book again. So in that way it worked out. But I mean, if you just take a quick look here, I mean look, look at the look at the font size. So here's the regular font. Here's the font size for the index. I mean, take a look. The rules go into 6.1, 3.3.1. I mean, oh my goodness. That, this page alone was kind of like, oh my God. But they have things in here that you, you, you may never, you may never use. You know, there's it's rules in here for gas and for trenches and for tanks and for aircraft and for artillery fire, indirect, di uh, direct, machine guns. I mean, when you think about it, World War One was probably the first war, or one of the first wars, maybe the American Civil War, you could kind of argue. Uh, but World War One to me, was the first war that had everything that we enjoy doing today in wargaming. Like, um, I know that the World War II scene is huge um, compared to, let's say, Napoleonics. But World War One was the beginning of all that. So they had to include rules for everything. Artil 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 ah, wow, artillery, tanks, uh, infantry, um, Cavalry still, I mean, trains, planes, automobiles. That's a note to a movie there. Um, but Great War Spearhead, if you are looking for a set of rules that can do it all for World War One, give you the flavor, uh, Great War Spearhead 2 is the rules for you. It's the ones that I would recommend. And one of the things that I particularly love about the Great War Spearhead rules is... Um, the pre-battle planning. Now, I'm a little rusty on exactly how it was done. This was a few years ago. I only taken these out now just to show off. But the pre-battle planning in this game was so much fun. Like it was a battle in itself. I mean, you have to set up um, two lines of trenches. Let's say if you're doing a trench battle, two lines of trenches, and player A, let's say the attacker, he has to pre-plot his artillery before the advance of the troops. And he has to, you know, in secret, mind you, plot his artillery. And then in secret, the defender puts down on a map, a hand-drawn map, where their defenders are going to be placed. And when both players have done that step, then you start, the attacker starts rolling for his artillery strikes to see what happened, what kind of damage was done. And there's various types of artillery. There's... You know, there's regular artillery, light artillery, heavy artillery, howitzers, all that kind of stuff. And the defender then has to declare if he has any units underneath the templates or where the artillery fire is going. Then they roll and they see if they're, if they're dead or not. But you can go down, you can, you can have an open game where you say, oh, well, I had eight stands there and three of them were killed by the artillery after the rolls. Or you can keep it a complete secret. You can keep it a complete secret until the enemy, let's say, gets to that position and then you have to declare using your map what happened. Oh, well, there was six bases here, but there's only two left. And it, it's, it's a real cool sense of the unknown. Um, it gives a, a really good narrative experience. I really loved pre-plotting the artillery. And it also made for a very fun convention game, like a, well, I shouldn't say convention game, really, more of a, a, a beer and pretzels um, large group game um, because you can break down the the commands the you can have a, a core commander you can have two divisional commanders you can have six brigade commanders and each one of those can be given a specific task to do pre-battle to plan their attacks and the core commander gets a really cool you know he could get a really cool ability as he could get to direct let's just move the camera here he could direct the, where the heavy artillery is going where the tank battalions are being sent. Uh, the divisional commander can s lay out the brigades in the order that he wants. He can tell them the objectives. Your objective is that, your objective is this. 
and then he can give the artillery, uh, the divisional artillery um, strikes. And then the brigade commanders get to move their blocks of men around and roll the dice and, and storm the trenches. And that was That's really fun. That's a really fun aspect of this game. And at this game that we played, that happened. And that happened to great effect. The corps commander, he didn't have to, to move hardly any troops, but he got to essentially plan the battle, give the give the uh, the objectives to the divisional commanders and the brigade commanders. He got to assign what units were going to have what support. So like a, um, the first division will have two infantry, or sorry, will have two artillery battalions supporting it. It'll have some aircraft supporting it, and blah blah blah, so on and so forth. And then once the battle starts, he, he's out. He he basically has has nothing to do anymore in in the, in the game. He can put in reserves. You know, he might say, I'm keeping this brigade in reserve, and if I see a breakthrough, I'm going to send it through, or I'm going to keep some cavalry back. Or, um, But he gets to sip his, his um, beverages, his beer, whatever he has, and he gets to eat his chips and have a good laugh. And the divisional commanders, they get the same kind of experience. They get to uh, do that kind of micro-managing of angles of attack and whatever. And then once that's sent down the chain, he gets to sit back and have a laugh and look at the game and take pictures and talk and have a chat. And uh, the brigade commanders, then they're relieved of all of those kind of like minutia of details. They just, they're told, you're, you, take these, you take these 20 bases straight for that tree line and you take it. And there's a kind of a relief in, well, I'm just moving. I'm just doing using the measuring tape and I'm just moving, guys. I don't really have anything to do except roll the dice and move the pieces and while the you know while the plotting and the planning is happening they're chatting and laughing and having a good talk um catching up on rules discussions it was a really fun experience so i know i've rambled on a lot but i've never got that experience out of any other rule set usually players have to control every aspect of the battle and they're they're in like a weird calculus math problem where they, you can't bother them, you can't talk to them. They're, they're trying to figure out what to do next. Where do I move my guy? Okay, that didn't work. What do I do here? Whereas so with this rule, what this rule set is, is the planning is all done ahead of time. When you're moving your miniatures up the table, you're set. You're locked into a certain course of action. And although that might seem, maybe the word might be one-dimensional, it actually is not. It, it it was a fun experience, and what everyone enjoyed about it was that it was authentic. It felt authentic. I mean, the divisional commander of one of our games, um, he was given a, a little trench line to take, but it had a, a hill with a sort of a ruined village in it, and the general player had two pillboxes there. Now, the free bombardment targeted those pillboxes. The player attacking them had no idea if they were neutralized or not. He had no idea. And he had to argue with his divisional commander and the corps commander to get some extra assets sent his way. And it was a fun experience listening to them argue about, like, why should I, like, I'm not going to be able to take this position without some tanks, without some more artillery. There's nothing I can do. I mean, you're just sending my men to their death. And eventually, after maybe five or six minutes of arguing, he was given a whole battalion of tanks, so four essentially bases of tanks. And in the course of the game, he's marching up his men to the to the trench. He's taking some fire, he's taking some losses. He still doesn't know exactly how many men are there. He can guess because of the amount of dice that's coming in. Um, but when he physically got to the to the fortifications, they had been destroyed by the heavy artillery. They had been destroyed. And his tanks just drove straight through and then got bogged down on the trench line like the trench line directly after the pillboxes. And on the other side of the battlefield, a brigade commander who had who seemed to have the easiest time of the initial orders, he was completely bogged down. Completely bogged down. He couldn't move. He was taking losses, extreme losses. He was getting counter-battery fired. He was taking bases off left, right, and center. And the discussion after the game, the whole reason I mentioned this, the discussion after the game was more about the pre-planning aspect of the game, like the kind of the pre-planning chess match that went on, 
more than the actual rolling of the dice. No one cared about, oh man, you got so lucky, you rolled three sixes on that turn. No one mentioned the dice roll. Everyone mentioned the plans, the strategies. And that was really fun. Anyway, enough of that. I don't think I need to really go into any more detail on that. Probably bored as stiff, but it's a really cool set of rules. I mean, it's got army lists in here for everything, for all the things. There's my uh, breakdown of my forces. But onto the armies here. Essentially what we have in front of us now that I've rambled on enough is the Canadian Army or part of the Canadian Army for the Vimy Ridge or 1917 campaigns in the Western Front. I, I do have the figures for the entire Canadian Corps which was made up of four individual divisions, one, two, three, and four, uh, but I don't have them all painted. I only painted the first division and the third division. Now, the Canadian Corps at this time was commanded by Arthur Curry, who is, if you know your Canadian World War I history, he's pretty famous to you. If you don't know your Canadian World War I history, he's um, probably one of their best commanders. And he commanded the Canadian Corps, and I have him painted right here. Well, not him, but I have the Canadian Corps painted. Well, let's see. New camera set up and it's, there we go. There's the Canadian Corps looking over their maps. Now these are Bacchus figures here. I'm pretty sure the car is Bacchus. I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure it is. But these are Bacchus figures here. I mean, you know, for six mil, what's wrong with that? Um, he then has under his command directly, he has the heavy artillery. So here you see some howitzers. These figures are from irregular miniatures and they come on these little like bases on their own. You can't really separate them. Um, well, they come with the bases, I should say. And they're, they're okay. They're okay figures, but they're kind of really old and they, they look like blobs, to be honest. I mean, the figures, like the actual like, crew members, there is no way you can pick out any details. You just paint them the, the color you think they should be, paint where you think the face is, the hands are, and that's that. But there's a British howitzer, or sorry, I guess rather a Canadian howitzer. And here's another, oh, he dropped, well, that's good. The good thing about regular figures is they're sturdy. You can drop them. There is the long barreled gun. And just to prove that, I dropped him from a good, Three feet. He's, he's perfectly fine, apart from some cat hair from King Cat here. Perfectly fine. The barrel didn't even bend. So details kind of terrible, but the durability is pretty good. And here we have tanks. These tanks, I believe, are Heroics and Ross. Or man, no, no, no. no. Um, I keep saying Heroics and Ross, but. It's Scotia. Scotia Grendel, I believe. Come on, zoom in. No one wants to see my, my thumbs. But, I mean, here's the tanks, tank battalions. Now, these are British tanks, but the Canadians got to use their services. So, essentially, there is three battalions of tanks, and they get divvied out by the... Uh, core commander at the time of the planning phases of the game for use. Here we have the first division of the Canadian Corps. I'm just going to grab my, my notes because I want to make sure I get this right. The first, like, it's been several years since I painted these, so it's hard to remember everything. But the first uh, division, who was he? He was, hmm, I don't know who the commander was, but. It might have been Curry, to be honest. Actually, it probably was Arthur Curry was commander of the first division. I might have it wrong. The Canadian Corps might have been might have been somebody else. Anyway, regardless, um, here we have the first division. Let's just reach in here. So here is Curry's actual command stand here, first division there. Uh, you notice I, I wrote the first division in blue, and the third division is in red. So when the stands are on the table, you can physically see them. So here is the. Bacchus figures, a little bit of a little tiny ruined house, staff car, a lot of flash in that staff car, I didn't bother getting it off. At this, at, at that, at that, 
distance from your eye no one's really going to see it so he has three brigades he has the first second the, the first is right here second and third brigade each brigade has four battalions one two three four a machine gun battalion and some support the mortars and a brigade stand so one and all you get 16 infantry 16 17 19 21 22, 23 stands per brigade so each division has three of those exactly the same Division also has these regular miniatures, regular field guns, 25 pounders or whatever it is that they had back then. And there's not a lot of detail there, but it's serviceable. You can tell it's an artillery piece, but I mean, there you go. Essentially, these are used kind of like a dice pool of airstrikes in World War II. You know, like, okay, on turn three, I'm going to use these three batteries to fire at that tree line right there. You get your three dice, you roll them, and that's that. Uh, but it's a, it's a cool concept. Um, in the 1st Division, in the 1st Brigade, we have the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Battalions. The 1st is the um, the Western Ontario. The 2nd is the... So here's that. The, here's the um, Western Ontario Battalion. We have the Central Ontario Battalion, the Eastern Ontario Battalion and the Toronto Battalion. And I, I, I have to say, in the game, you don't really, in the rule set, sorry, well, shaky cam, uh, it's on a tripod, sorry. So in the in the, in the rule set, you don't actually have to have them, them labeled at all. I did that more for just respect for the subject matter. And I, I like the idea of the battalions kind of being on their own and their own little like element. Um, but essentially, all you care about as the player is the brigade stand and his many stands of figures. Now I know the, if we move back there, we get them all in a stand, but yeah, the brigade stand is all you care about along with his blob of bases. But for me, I like doing it. The subject matter, I couldn't do it any other way. Just I'm interested in the period and I wanted to make sure that the individual units got their due on the battlefield. Plus it makes for a fun narrative experiences as when like a, Let's say this unit here takes an objective. You can always say to yourself, "Oh, the Eastern, the Eastern Ontario Regiment took that um, position." And it's a it's a cool way. Um, the Second Brigade over here, or oh, he's right there. The Second Brigade, he has obviously the Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth Battalions, uh, but it's actually the Fifth, Seventh, Eighth, and Tenth Battalion. So he has in him, right here, he has the the Western Cavalry. He has the 1st BC Regiment, he has the um, the Canadians Battalion, and he has the British Columbia Regiment as well, or Battalion, I guess. They're technically battalions, but whenever they're being recruited, I guess, you're in the Toronto Regiment, but you're technically the, uh, what's that, the 3rd Battalion in the Canadian Army. Um, and then in the 3rd Brigade, right here, we have the... 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th battalions, those being the Canadian Scottish, the Royal Highlanders of Canada, the 40th Highlanders of Canada, and the Royal Montreal Regiment. And it's um, on the bases here, I have the Scotia Grendel figures. Now that I've got the manufacturer correct, I'll show you the Scotia Grendel figures. I mean, the lighting here is probably not the best, even though I did try to improve my lighting quite a bit recently. Um, the figures are mainly monopose. The officer looks a little bit janky there, but the figures themselves of the infantry, they're not that bad. And right here on the base, you see I have, well, yeah, I have the 3rd Brigade, sorry, bad camera issue. The 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division, the RMR, which is the Royal Montreal Regiment, and they're there. Now, those figures are actually really nice figures. I, I, sh I should say a little bit more about them. They're actually really nice figures, the Scotia Grendel figures. Uh, they're machine guns. I'll take a look at the machine guns here. The machine guns are kind of blobbish. They're not really all that spectacular. But, I mean, on the field, all you care about is the dice that they, um, they give out. Now, 
you know, I probably didn't get in uh, zoomed in as much as I could. I mean, I could try. Uh, again, I'm not professional at this, but I find when I zoom in, it gets very blurry. So I don't really like doing that. Let me go back out, make everyone dizzy. But if we move over here, we have the Canadian 3rd Division. And the Canadian 3rd Division, although it is a Canadian division, sorry, let me just move this box underneath my table here to get my tripod in. The Canadian 3rd Division, we got them on screen there. Yes, we do. Okay, they are different figures. They are from Bacchus. Now, Bacchus, their World War I rage is relatively new. And their figures are, their infantry figures are exactly to scale, I would say, to the Scotia ones. Uh, but their artillery pieces and their staff cars and their horses and their machine guns and, and all those things are substantially bigger figures. So here's the regular looking, whoops, I almost dropped him. Here's the regular looking figure from, um, there's a Scotia Grendel officer there, but there's four physical figures from Bacchus and they're nicely sculpted and there's different various poses whereas the Scotia ones don't have various poses the Bacchus ones do have various poses particularly like the running guy and I think there is a guy firing so these two here at the back they're really nice figures and if I take a look here at the divisional artillery they have some mortars the mortars here, you know, pretty detailed for six mil. You have to remember, and then they have their field guns. Now I'm just going to give you a little bit of a comparison after I show you this gun. Now that uh, I've ruined that, I hope this all comes on camera here. I'm kind of doing this askew, but it's much bigger on the base. It looks like an artillery piece. It looks like the field gun is supposed to be. The crew looks to scale with it. And if I just for one second give you the exact same gun in irregular figures you have this one and then you have this one i mean really there's no comparison between the two guns one just looks like a blob of metal and the other one has some definition to it sorry about my bad camera ship i wish i wish i was better at this but i'm just starting out and with a family i don't really have much time to to do this kind of stuff but here we have the three brigades um the good thing about the canadian or the easy thing to learn about the canadian core is that it's one two three four divisions and each division goes exactly in sequence so the first division has the first second and third brigade second division is the <laughs> fourth fifth and sixth and so the third will have the seventh eighth and ninth brigade and in these brigades here you have one two and three all laid out the 7th Brigade, uh, it has in it the 42nd Highlanders. So maybe I can get that here. The 7th Brigade has the 42nd Highlanders right here. It has the Princess Patricia Light Infantry, a very famous regiment even to this day uh, in Afghanistan and all the rest. It has the, the RCR, which is the, uh, I believe that's the Royal Canadian Regiment, and has the 49th uh, battalion which is the Edmonton battalion I want to make sure I get those all in, in there I mean it's I don't know why it's important to me to make sure I mention who they are but it is uh, the 8th brigade which we have up here this is the 8th brigade it has in it let's see what's this the 1st 2nd 4th and 5th Royal uh, Canadian mounted rifles so there are four battalions of the same regiment the uh, they call it, I guess it's uh, the CMR, I guess, the Canadian Mounted Rifles. And then you have the 9th Brigade over here, which is a little bit more diverse than that. It has four separate battalions. It has the um, Victoria. Who is this? Is that the Victoria? This is the Victoria Regiment here. This is the 43rd Highlanders. The Cameron Highlanders, yeah. Here we have the Northern Ontario Regiment. And here we have the Central Ontario Regiment. Well, I guess technically battalion, but... The regiment um it's kind of hard to explain but over here we had the third division and that would be commanded by if that one if the first division was arthur curry the third division was lipset lewis lewis lipset and that's that's basically it that's just showing you my canadian the canadian core well what i have 
the first division and the second division. It's about a thousand, uh, I wouldn't say a thousand, about 790-ish figures um, all told. I do have the Germans for the same thing, but the Germans are much, much smaller. They're about a third of this size. I mean, the Defender it has such a great advantage, um, as you would think, as you would expect, I guess. It has such a great advantage, you wouldn't really need anything more than about a third. So, for instance, the the defender does not does not get any tanks. He gets he does get some artillery, but he doesn't get um, a lot of it. He gets a fair bit. He does get about a brigade's worth of infantry. About maybe I'd say about probably this amount of infantry. But he has a long sector to defend. But what he does get is he gets uh, pillboxes, MG tons of MG pillboxes, tons of hard points. He actually gets to, I believe, in one of the rules or one of the uh, scenarios, I can't remember now, but precisely, but he does get to put like dummy objectives down. He does get to say, uh, you know, here's a pillbox, but when you get there, it actually wasn't a pillbox. It was nothing. It was just a little redoubt. So he gets to do that. And then at the beginning of the game, he gets to do that. And then the allied player then has to kind of like figure out like which one's the real one, which one's not. They get to spend points on scouting, so they can scout an area with an aircraft first if they want to see if it's a fake one or a real one. It's a fun game. I would recommend it, highly recommend it. And I mean, I mean, look, this is, you think this is hard to paint? This brown blob with some bayonet colors and some flesh, some different earth tones. Not hard to do at all. You could paint a whole division in a weekend. So I can't recommend them enough. Um, you know, thanks for tuning in. Sorry about the long rant, the long ramble. It's 31 minutes. Who's ever going to listen to the whole video? Nobody. Uh, but I did get, I did buy myself some professional-ish professional -ish lighting right there. And I have some behind me as well. So hopefully that will solve my lighting issue in the basement. Um, my next thing is to get a professional mic stand. I do have this thing here on a, a tripod, which was my first time trying it. I mean, I wish probably wishing I got in a little closer to the action here but you know maybe when I bring out the, the German division maybe we'll try something different anyway thanks for joining me I really appreciate it um, I did get a couple call outs this week on Facebook um, on the Facebook groups for Age of Hannibal and I believe Little Legions um, and that just like that blew my what that blew my mind my wife screamed at me she's like did you see this and um, that was really exciting and I have to sign off here but I'd just like to say that it's been um, personally for me this has been a, a healing experience I haven't had the best year I've had a lot of health problems and uh, you know I'm gonna try and do this as often as I can show off more stuff show off more unboxings and try and do a bit more hobby wise because it seems to be the only thing in my life that is giving me any kind of purpose at the moment so thanks again and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.